Thank you, Dan. I, I want to just take a moment to say thank you for your leadership. Thank you for Aspen Institute's support of Aspen Institute Kiev. Um, at the very early stages of the full-scale invasion, we had to evacuate some of our, our female um, leaders and their children. The men had to stay behind by law if, the, if they were of conscription age. And it was because of an Aspen Kiev crisis fund that was established by the Institute. I have to thank Dan. Uh, May he rest in peace, Jim Crown, Margot Prisker, Claire Munana, Elliot Gerson, and everyone at Aspen Institute in the United States and internationally for supporting our team through this last 18 months. It wasn't just a humanitarian effort, but it was also to keep our programming going. And our programming is really, really important. And I cannot tell you how valuable it is to people to continue to be able to attend Aspen seminars at times like this, they want to talk about values in society. They want to talk about how to reestablish the social contract when the war is over. And we have leaders from the Minister of Defense of Ukraine, who is our alumni, to the Deputy Prime Minister for, Re for European Union Affairs, to people on the front lines fighting, to medics, all across society. And it is thanks to your leadership and your commitment and your contributions to this Kiev Crisis Fund that we're able to continue working right now. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you. So, um, and let me thank you, Ambassador, um, on behalf of everyone here for a lifetime of service. A rare, as Dan said, three ambassadorships, but also besides the ambassadorships in Ukraine, uh, Armenia and, and Kyrgyzstan, also service in Somalia, the UK, uh, Russia, and, and in Washington. Um, mm -hmm. Your, co your commitment to public service um, continued and was magnified, in fact, during the historic congressional testimony that you gave uh, towards the end of the Trump administration, and now documented for all in this incredible book, which you can all get, as Dan said, after um, this event, for generations, for future generations to learn about that commitment to service. And I start from the beginning. You dedicated this book to your parents, uh, Nadia and Michelle, Michael, I mm -hmm. might not say it right. Um, and you and I are both children of immigrants, mm -hmm. which has given us a lot uh, of background. Um, technically, you may be an immigrant as well from Canada, but <laughs> children of immigrants. Um, you know, Canada. <laughs> um, and I, I know that the, the history of their lives and the trials that they went through, to a large extent in less democratic circumstances, mm -hmm. influences um, not only the gratitude that you have for the country, but your commitment um, your commitment to the cause of democracy, to the cause of public service. And so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how your parents and their history mm -hmm. uh, impacted your choices, your decisions, who you are, and, 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 and how it made the cover of the book. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, it's, it's just an honor to be with you again, Natalie. It's really great to be here in Aspen as well. Um, I, um, so I wrote the book for many different reasons, um, but one of them uh, was to honor my parents, who, uh, as Natalie has said, were immigrants to the United States. We came to the U.S. with nothing. They had grown up um, in, um, you know, during World War II uh, under very difficult circumstances, both of them. Um, under authoritarian regimes, and um, when they finally got to the United States, they were just grateful uh, that they had sanctuary here in the United States. And um, they never took for granted uh, the rights that we get as citizens, um, even actually as visitors or uh, to the United States. And um, they brought my brother up and I to really remember that, that um, we have rights and we are privileged because we have rights in the United States, because they knew what it was like not to be able to say what you wanted, not to be able to worship as you pleased, and, not, uh, and to live in fear. Um, and so to be in, you know, bucolic rural Connecticut, um, having, um, you know, employment and being able to say what you want, worship as you please, and not living in fear, that was pretty special for my parents. And I think it's something that sometimes um, 
we take for granted in the US. And what my parents um, tried to teach my brother and I was that with those rights come responsibilities. And each one of us has a responsibility to keep that, um, you know, to keep those rights intact, to build our democracy, to keep on making it the best country in the world. Because as we know from our founding fathers, that's what it requires. I mean, democracy isn't one and done, it's a constant effort. And um, they, were, um, they were both teachers, they brought up generations of students, some of whom are still in touch with my brother and I. And they you know, did the important things in the classroom, but also outside of the classroom. And I'm sure everybody in this room has at least one teacher that they remember that really shaped their lives. And my parents were those people. You know, we talk a lot about public service, and I think public service is extremely important. And if anybody here wants to join the Foreign Service, please join me outside after this <laughs> session. Uh, but, um, but you know, we can give back in so many ways, um, you know, whether it's through teaching, whether it's through volunteering, uh, whether it's through, you know, joining the police force or, um, you know, joining the military. It, it, there are so many different ways that um, we can help to build um, our, great, our great country. And my parents were all about that. And that, um, that um, you know, kind of lesson that they sort of instilled in us, not only by what they said, but by their example every day, uh, was what took me into the Foreign Service. because. Um, you know, they wanted me to be happy in what I did, um, and so I finally found my passion with, um, you know, many different detours in my early 20s, sometimes that happens, um, and, uh, you know, in, in my later 20s, I found the Foreign Service. It, it combined, uh, you know, my interest in history, it, um, you know, in foreign policy, uh, in traveling around the world, in meeting people from different cultures, eating the food, the, learning the languages, all of that was in one career, and it came with a paycheck. And so this was the <laughs> career for me. And um, I, um, yeah, that's how I got into public uh, well, service. It, we, we've had a dialogue, I'm looking at Arjun, about um, the younger generation not always believing that they have to start at the bottom, that they have to work hard. And you describe in the book when you arrived at the Foreign Service, mind you, from Princeton, right? I mean, many, many choices in that menu. You describe that it was not necessarily what you expected, but you were willing to stick it out. Can you talk a little bit about why you think that approach is important and what it gave you later in your career? Yeah. So um, I do think the, the, the State Department, the Foreign Service, is an apprenticeship kind of a place. There's not a lot of training. There's not a lot of education. There should be more of both. We should have more of a military um, um, kind of uh, perspective on, on these things because, I mean, even Colin Powell, right, benefited from training and education, and certainly the rest of us would as well, including in the Foreign Service. So it's kind of a sink or swim operation. You learn by doing and observing uh, what you know other people around you and your bosses are doing, and some of those things are examples of the kind of person, the kind of employee, the kind of leader you want to be, and then there were you know some where you learned what you didn't want to be, and you tried to avoid doing those. Equally those, important, those, right? <laughs> equally important. Um, you tried to to do a little bit of that, but it's um, I think that um, there is some value to an apprenticeship kind of a, a model because you um, end up doing a lot of different things in the beginning of your career. So in my case, in Somalia, I was what was called a general services officer. And so what that meant was I was in charge of keeping the generators going in a, in a city <laughs> where there was electricity for three hours a week. And they didn't tell you when the three hours were going to be. It would just come <laughs> on randomly. And um, so keeping the generators going, keeping, um, you know, purchasing diesel for the generators and the vehicles that needed in, in a country that was uh, very corrupt. It was difficult to get um, to get um, our supplies in and, you know, actually to their intended destination without a lot of pilfering along the way. Um, I was responsible for the motor pool. I was responsible for shipping. I was responsible for all sorts of things I didn't really want to be responsible for. But I learned a lot. I learned, um, you know, the kind of boss I wanted to be. I learned the kind of boss I didn't want to be. I learned, um, you know, this was my first exposure really to corruption, not only um, what we call petty corruption, um, but, you know, kind of grand corruption on a grand government um, scheme where everybody is, um, you know, uh, 
getting a cut of whatever the action is up to and including the president. And so that was really difficult for me to deal with. And uh, you know, sometimes my supervisors were rock solid on things and sometimes they were a little sketchy. And so how do you handle that as a very junior person in an organization? So I learned a lot there and I found that, you know, as I sort of made my way up the ladder in the foreign service, it was really valuable experience because you can draw on it. So when somebody comes to you from a, a, a particular section in the embassy and they're talking about something, you actually know what they're talking about, not because you kind of know it because you kind of saw them from far away, but because you've done that job. And that gives you a lot of credibility, a you know, lot of credibility. Talking about Somalia, it was difficult in so many ways. It was unhealthy. You, you, you talk in the book about unhealthy from an environmental standpoint. It was a very difficult situation um, from an infrastructure perspective. And then you had a very difficult situation with, if I understood, the president's nephew. Yeah. Um, all of this difficulty in your first first posting abroad, and you just invited everyone to join the Foreign Service. How do we, how, how do we? Well, and I have to tell you, uh, go ahead. Well, you, you well, the, question the question is, what do we tell young people about joining the Foreign Service? How do we get them to do that, knowing they're going to read that chapter in the book and go, oh my God, you know, like, yeah. I can't handle this. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I wish I could tell you that I was in Somalia and I just, kicked it and I was so great and everything. When I left Somalia, I bid on, um, I, I asked for an assignment in London because I figured in London, I could look for another job in another profession. <laughs> you know, it was like I was ready to quit um, because this is not what I had been imagining at all. Um, but, um, and, and, and actually I should tell you that in London, I um, worked for an ambassador named Henry Caddo, who I think has had a very long, or had a very long standing uh, relationship with Aspen and was just a fabulous guy. Um, so I, I will tell you that, you know, I learned in Somalia, which is to this day the hardest post I ever had because I was so young and so new to everything and there just wasn't a lot of support. Um, but you know what doesn't, it, it's true that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> and uh, I, I was able to make it through that and throughout the rest of my career when you know things were not looking good I would say, well I made it through Somalia, I can do this, I can do this, I've got it. Um, so I think, um, I think um, part of it is um, you know, uh, we have uh, in the Foreign Service a very difficult career. I mean, you're going to all sorts of places all over the world, some of which are wonderful, like London, um, and other places which are really challenging, like Mogadishu, Somalia. Um, but you, um, but we're doing important work there, uh, even if it is like what I was doing, is supporting the mission rather than actually negotiating with the president or whatever. Um, but it's important work, and I think that keeps you going. And uh, when I talk to um, people about the Foreign Service, um, you know, I tell them, I mean, if you want a career that involves um, foreign policy and traveling the world, and a career um, that will make a difference in your life, in the lives of the people that you uh, represent, the American people, as well as the lives of the people in the countries that you are posted to, that is the Foreign Service. There's just nothing as rewarding as that. And so even though um, there are, uh, you know, as always, a lot of challenges in every post, including London, I might add, um, but um, but the I think the highs um, overcome the lows, and I think that's uh, that's the essence of, of a great career. And the other thing I would say is you come away with it with lots of good stories for dinner parties. <laughs> you can write a book. You get <laughs> you to write, write a book. book. <laughs> Some of the high points, we all think about these bureaucratic jobs, kind of, if you're not a member of government, to be kind of a cog in a wheel and very slow. And then, But there are these decisive moments, and you've had many of them. I'll describe one, and I'm going to ask you to think about others, where you've had the opportunity to do something that's just you know, extraordinary as an individual. And the decisive moment that I took out of the, the book was you were instrumental when you were serving in Washington in the Ops Center in rerouting US rescue helicopters that were going to the wrong location, of a former embassy location, to the right location to then save and evacuate over 100 people, our employees, other, ambass other foreign uh, embassies. And, and you were placed in that situation. You had to make that decision. You had the knowledge, um, having served there. Can you share some of the moments like that, some of those extraordinary moments that you've had 
where it was up to you and, and you had to decide and your decisiveness and the, and the opportunity that you had made history. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that was a very special moment with with, uh, with Somalia, where you know the, the embassy compound was um, being overrun um, by uh, the rebels in Somalia, and I mean there were literally minutes to go uh, for the safety of our uh, embassy employees, as well as you know the very few Americans that were still left there, and our foreign colleagues. And um, so, you know, obviously getting the helicopters to the right place at the right time was important. But in this instance, it was, it was again, down to the maps, right? Mapping so important. And we had built a new embassy in uh, Mogadishu, but the military had the location of the old, um, the old embassy. And then, Hard to you know, what, what are the odds? One of the Marines on the, hel uh, on the lead helicopter had actually served at Embassy Mogadishu as a Marine guard. And you know, what, is, what are the odds of that? And when he got the map, he said, we're going to the wrong place. So um, you know, I, don't, I don't know what all the phone call the tree was. I'm sure they were calling everybody in Washington. But they got to me in the operations center at the State Department. I happened to be on shift, and I happened to get the call, and I happened to know. And so I was able to confirm what that Marine said. And so they did reroute, and we did get our people out. But it was, um, it was very dramatic, as, <laughs> as uh, Natalie said. So um, other, other examples. Moments? So uh, one um, example was when I was relatively new as ambassador to Ukraine, and um, it's, uh, you know, we had, um, you know, important um, financial um, programs, as Natalie is all too well aware, <laughs> with Ukraine. And this was after, after her, her, uh, her, her time there. And um, the Ukrainians were, um, shall we say, um, reneging on some of the promises that, that they had made to us. Was as it me? Well. <laughs> it wasn't Natalie. She was not in government. Um, uh, promises that they had made not only to the US, um, but to the World Bank, to the IMF, to the EBRD, and to other entities and countries. And so I had been there like maybe four weeks. I had met the prime minister once. And I find myself calling him on a Sunday night saying, you know, you need to, <laughs> you need to reverse this decision you've just made, or else the US is not going to sign off on a $3 billion loan, and, uh, loan guarantee. And um, I can't speak for you know, the other entities, but I think they're probably going to follow suit. And you know, so I'm stumbling around this conversation because I barely had command of the fact and it's all in you know, a, a language that is not my native language. And um, I can hear his children crying in the background because it's a Sunday <laughs> night. It, and I'd met him once in a courtesy call. And here I am you know, coming down pretty hard. So he's like, well, I don't know anything about this. But um, yeah, uh, this had been a decision that he had made in the middle of the night several nights ago at a cabinet meeting. Don't know anything about this, but um, le let me look into it and I'll convene, you know, I'll convene you and others. So on Tuesday, there was a limited cabinet meeting with some of the other um, interested parties, the, the, all of the entities that I just mentioned. And again, you know, I'm new. I've been there four weeks. Um, probably the person in the room who knows the least about this issue. And everybody looks to me because I was representing the US and the US leads. And so, um, you know, <laughs> I uh, went through uh, the, the whole thing, and at the very end, um, you know, there was agreement, and you know, the smiles were starting to break out, and the prime minister said, so we'll, we'll suspend the decision. And so I'm thinking, suspend the decision. So this is through an interpreter, and I'm thinking, suspend? Uh, and I said, well, so wanting to be diplomatic, I said, I don't know if this was a, you know, a translation error, but suspend or you will reverse <laughs> the decision. And um, you know, some um, talk uh, between the interpreter and several other people, and they came back and he said, we mean we'd reverse the decision. <laughs> so that was a big win, um, and actually a really bigger win for Ukraine. Absolutely, $3 billion plus. Yeah, plus. Would have been blocked, thank you. So you talk in the book a bit about the challenges of being a woman in the Foreign Service, but the challenges of being a woman in most professions uh, follow us to this day, unfortunately. And you mentioned often, and I've had this, this imposter syndrome that you deal yeah. with, and, 
And as we all battle um, for equality, we think of historic names. We think of women like Susan B. Anthony, we think of Elizabeth Stanton, Sojourner Truth, Rosa Parks, Shirley Chisholm. But tell me about a successful diplomat that maybe nobody ever heard of that made a real difference for women in the Foreign Service, Alison Palmer. Oh, Alison Palmer. Um, so that's not who I was thinking you were going to mention. Um, so Oops. Alison Palmer. No. You can see we didn't rehearse in advance. <laughs> yeah. Alison Palmer. If there's actually. someone else you want to talk about, that's fine. <laughs> I was going to say Beth Jones, who is the, um, the inspiration for The Diplomat. I don't know if any of you have um, seen that show. Yeah, so she was a friend. She, well, in the beginning, she was a mentor. Um, and um, she has become a friend, and she is just phenom a phenomenal diplomat. But Alison Palmer was too. So Alison Palmer um, came into the Foreign Service, I want to say in the 1940s, um, as a single woman, very, very unusual um, as an officer and not as support staff, very unusual. And um, she had all of the prejudices that you would expect, you know, where she was, she'd be told point blank, you can't have that job, you know, the man needs that job um, because he's supporting a family. You know, you're not you're, you're not good enough for this other job. You know, we want you to be doing something else. So she sued. She sued the department, and she won. And um, so she got the jobs she wanted, but she wasn't done. She then launched a class action lawsuit for on behalf of all women in the State Department to say that um, basically that the State Department um, was discriminating against women across the board. And in 1992, um, she won. Uh, an appellate court uh, ruled that the State Department was um, discriminating against women on the exam, on how they graded the exam, on how they took, put women on the list, you know, where you ranked, um, on the, the uh, specialties they were assigned, and on um, how they were uh, rated, how they were promoted. So pretty much Everybody. across the board. And amazing that there are, you know, Natalie was a Foreign Service officer uh, in this era, as was I. Amazing that, um, that we actually even got in. So um, I, when I had come into the State Department, I had wanted to be a political officer. Political officers are what you generally think of as, you know, the diplomatic work, the dealing, <laughs> well, I was an the econ officer. officer. <laughs> it's the glamour yeah. part of the job. It's, a, it's, it's the substantive part of the job. <laughs> Both of them are. And... Um, <laughs> But it, th these two jobs, let me just rephrase, <laughs> these two specialties are where you're um, you know, dealing with the substance of what the economic, commercial, political issues are in the country that you're in, um, you're dealing in treaty work, you're, you're representing the United States, and it's, um, you know, to me, that was why I had joined the Foreign Service. It was really, I thought, going to be interesting work. And they put me in the administrative specialty, which is basically supporting um, all of those efforts, and so there I was in Somalia doing, you know, the motorcade and <laughs> the diesel um, purchases and various other things, which, you know, I learned a lot in that job, but it wasn't what I wanted to be doing. So fast forward to 1992, um, Alison Palmer won, and so the State Department had to figure out how to um, actually implement the ruling that was court ordered. And um, this was extremely unpopular in the State Department. At that time, most of, uh, most of our bosses were men. I mean, there were a couple of you know, real pioneers, uh, female pioneers, but most of our bosses were men. And they hated this ruling. And of course, they were the ones who had fought this tooth and nail over the decades, the, this court ruling over, over the decades. So now they were in charge of implementing it. And, you know, I could read the tea leaves. Um, you know, I wasn't going to speak up about, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's something to this lawsuit because it was just so unpopular. So um, I was approached in 1992 um, to say that I fit the category of women that had been discriminated against and did I want to be a part of, uh, of the settlement. There were 14 uh, slots uh, that women could compete for to um, ultimately change what their specialty would be. And the first part of that would be um, going into, you know, picking an assignment in that in that specialty, you know, if you succeeded, then you could ultimately change the specialty. And I thought, well, this is my only shot at, cha at changing my specialty, right? I've got to do this. But on the other hand, I thought, if I do it, 
You know, I'm never going to have that seat at the table and people are never going to look at me as though I really deserve it, that I got it on the merits. Because, you know, I've been hearing all the talk in the department about how unfair this was to, uh, to, to the men in the department. So um, I thought about it and I joined the lawsuit, but um, I never told anybody in the State Department. Um, obviously, some people in administration had to know about it. I got an assignment. I, that was actually the assignment in Moscow, uh, which was career changing for me. After that, I was able to, um, you know, not only was I successful in that job, but I was able to change cones, and it really shaped the rest of my career. But I thought, you know, I'm not going to share this with people because they're still going to think that I didn't really deserve, you know, whatever the next job was. And, um, you know, this may be familiar to some of the people in this audience. The, the little, you know, devil that sits on your um, shoulder that goes, you're not good enough, you can't really do this job, you don't deserve to be here. So through three, through, excuse me, through three ambassadorships where, you know, you would have thought that by that point I would be secure enough in, in my um, position, but I never shared that with anybody. It was only when I wrote the book um, that um, I decided I had to share that because it was so important, um, not only for me and for my development, yeah. but for actually the department itself. A lot of changes came from that lawsuit. Not only the lawsuit, there were other things that happened as well. Because as you know, legal remedies are not the only thing that you know, make our institutions live up to our ideals. It's also um, a change in culture. And there were men and women who were changing the culture in the State Department, and I thought it was important to, um, to bring that out. But I was still kind of nervous, and so I focus grouped you know, my, my female friends. Do we do this or not? I mean, do I put this out there or not? And they were all, and you know most of them, you know, to, to a woman, were like, yeah, we need to put this in. It's really important that someone stood up for that then, because we wouldn't have yeah. seen you and your glorious career through today without them, so. I want to take us to Ukraine, a place that both of us love dearly and mm -hmm. uh, is top of the news again after the NATO summit in Vilnius. Ambassador, you served in Ukraine, uh, at the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine twice. Once, um, just before, if I remember correctly, the Orange Revolution. Right. Mm -hmm. And then once after the Revolution of Dignity. So the Orange Revolution is 2004. You arrived at the end of 2004? I was there from 2001 to 2004. I left right so, before okay, the right revolution. Right before the revolution, the Orange Revolution. So you were there before the what I call the second revolution. So Ukrainians have had three revolutions. The revolution on the sidewalk is during the Soviet period in, the ni in 91, the Orange Revolution in 2004, and then the Revolution of Dignity, which is 2013 to 14. You were there before one and then after the, the last, right? Mm -hmm. And you've seen massive changes. Ukraine has gone through massive societal changes from 1991, from independence in 1992, through uh, today. And you could help us to understand, because when the Soviet Union fell, many people, and I was in private equity, as Dan said, I used to go out and fundraise, and people would say, we have a category for that part of the world, we invested in Russia, it's the same thing. Russia and Ukraine were the same thing. Russians and Ukrainians were the same thing. Some of them spoke the same language. Some of them belonged to the same church. It's the same thing. They just have two countries. Now, they never did before. That was the story. And you know, you and I probably had a little bit more background to know that that wasn't true, but that was what people thought for a long time. So when you arrive in the 2000 mm -hmm. period, what is Ukraine, what is civil society, what does it look like, and then you come back in 2014, and what does it look like in 2014 after the third revolution? Yeah, so that is such an interesting question. So um, civil society is something we don't even think about in the United States because it is so much a part of us. It's who we are. It's the Aspen Institute. It's the Police Benevolent Association. It's the PTA. It's the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts. It's all the things we do to make our society go. You know, nobody's telling us that we need to um, uh, to create a club for kids for um, square dancing, but the parents can see that this is what the kids want, and so they just do it. They organize it. Maybe that's it, what the parents wanted, and they force their kids. But <laughs> yeah, separate maybe, story. Maybe that's the case. Um, but you get the point that that in America we don't wait for the mayor or the president or somebody to tell us that we need to do something. We see that something needs to be done, and maybe it's something that you know our government isn't doing. 
um, like uh, you know, a local government not putting a stop sign where it needs to be for the safety of children crossing that particular street to school. You know, we're we're gonna you know let the mayor know that has to happen, and if it doesn't happen, we're gonna you know get get a letter writing campaign, and if that doesn't happen, he's out of a job. Uh, that's what civil society is. Often it's political, but most often it's not. It's just all of us doing our things to make our communities better. And in the Soviet era, so I'm going to take us even, even, further. Further, even further back. In the Soviet era, everything was run by the Communist Party. They stamped out any vestige of civil society in any of the um, areas that the Soviets and before that the Russian Empire ruled um, because it was perceived as a threat. So um, the, the Communist Party organized everything. If you raised your hand and had an opinion, you would be suppressed. And so people learned not to have initiative, not to you know, do something that might be perceived as you know, going outside of the, the, the box that they were put in. And so you know, even like a chess club, for example, kids getting together you know, with their own little chess club that they put together together because it was uh, you know, fun to meet after school. That couldn't happen unless it was under the auspices of the Communist Party, the children's arm of that. So 1991 happens, and um, all of a sudden the Soviet Union has fallen apart. The Communist Party is outlawed in many of these countries. Um, and people, you know, the, the leaders of all of these countries, um, I think to a man, <clears throat> and they were all men, um, you know, went from being, you know, the first secretary of the Communist Party in their particular um, area to um, being, you know, the president of that country. They were elected, um, but nothing had changed in their outlook or the way that they led or knew even knew how to lead. You know, many of them talked about democracy and um, market economies, but they had no idea what that, that meant. Um, and so the same thing was true with the citizens of those countries, where all initiative had been stamped out. And so, um, you know, even if they could see something needed to be done, they were afraid to do it. They didn't have the skills to do it. They didn't know what should be happening. So that was 1991. By the time I got there in 2001, um, you could already see that there was the beginning of, 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 of civil society, and in fact, I thought it was pretty advanced coming from Russia, where it was far less advanced. And um, there were, you know, intrepid um, investigative journalists, one of whom paid with his life in a particularly gruesome murder uh, because he was investigating the president. And um, you know, you could see the burgeoning of um, people taking responsibility not only for themselves and for their small communities, but also for bigger politics. And that is what led directly to the Orange, Orange Revolution, Revolution, where it came from below. Uh, it came from the people who felt that an election had been, um, you know, falsified, and they prevailed. And that too gave people, I think, a lot of. Um, a lot, a and lot of it's really enthusiasm. important for everybody to know that you know in the in that revolution in the previous one in '91, even after the Chernobyl um, blew up in '86, there was no violence, not a broken window. <laughs> that revolution, the Orange Revolution, occurred with a million people on the streets, and n nothing happened. No one was hurt. No one was killed. And it kind of takes us to the revolution dignity. Ukraine was a very peaceful place. Yeah. And I would say, you know, except for the war against Russia, it still is. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, fast forward again. So actually, in 2004, what happened was the people won. They were victorious. And they were like, good, you know, now we're going to go back to our regular lives, and we're going to uh, let the politicians handle all of this. And then the president who was elected uh, was frankly a disappointment and kind of followed in the same mold as everybody else. And um, so uh, during that time, civil society continued to develop. And this is something I think that the American people can be really proud of because we had all sorts of programming through USAID and through other, um, other organizations to help um, people learn those skills of, you know, how do you, how do you do budgeting? I mean, if you're a mayor and you have never um, had to actually budget for um, your community because Kiev told you, you know, this year we're going to give you X uh, number of um, 
dollars uh, to build a new roof in your school because that's what we've decided here in Kiev. You don't need budgeting. In fact, it's probably kind of discouraged. So we help people um, you know, develop all of the skills that you would actually need to take more responsibility and to be more active and to be more responsible. So um, you know, fast forward to 2014 uh, with Yanukovych and Yanukovych is uh, run out of the country um, after uh, the Revolution of Dignity, which sadly was, um, was, was violent, uh, where uh, over 100 people were killed because Yanukovych called the um, special forces out onto the street. And um, it was, um, I think, a very <sighs> difficult time, I think, for everybody in Ukraine. I don't think anybody ever thought that, that, that they would see something uh, like that in Ukraine. So. Um, uh, in 2014, civil society didn't make the same mistake that they made in 2004. They were like, we're here to stay. We, um, some of them went into politics, um, joined the government um, that Natalie was finance minister of. Um, some of them um, were... Became the executive director of Aspen Institute Kiev. Yulia Tchikivska was on that Maidan, on that square in that revolution. Her husband serves now voluntarily as a Marine on the front. He was a part of that revolution. They were the young people on that square. Yeah. They never stopped working. Never. Right, exactly. And, um, you know, other people stayed in civil society, but did the sorts of things that we do here in the United States, where you're part of a think tank or an organization, where you're helping, um, you know, politicians draft laws, uh, coming up with some of the research that they need to do their jobs. And so civil society in Ukraine is just super, super developed. And part of that, um, I think, um, you know, I mean, with great credit to, I think, the Ukrainian people. And it really does differentiate, especially today. If you look at what's happened in Belarus or in Russia, they are different societies 30 years later, having come from that same Soviet system. They've developed so differently. And what you see in Ukraine today, in terms of the response to this horrific war, is very much because of that civil society, that ability to take responsibility and not wait for instructions. Now I'm gonna have, I have one last question before we go to Q&A. And, you know, you've been to Ukraine several times. We are on day 504 of the full-scale, horrific, genocidal invasion of Ukraine. And you've been there several times. I was there recently with you about a month ago. What could you tell us about your visit that someone couldn't have read in the paper or seen in the press? What did, what did you see there that you think we should know? Well, um, I mean, I think there are several things, and perhaps it isn't so much that this is like a, a, an epiphany you're going to get tonight that you couldn't read in the newspaper, um, but maybe reinforce some of the things you already know. But I think, um, first of all, every time I go to Ukraine, uh, it is so clear to me that every man, woman, and child is mobilized. Um, they know what they are doing. They know what they need to do to fight and prevail against the Russians. They are fighting for their families. They are fighting for their freedom. They are fighting for their future. And they are intent on that. One of my uh, former employees at the uh, embassy, um, he's a political officer, it turns out he has all sorts of tech skills. And so he was, there isn't actually a draft in Ukraine, but he was drafted because he had those tech skills. He's working in a drone unit now. And um, his drone unit was, um, so this is a story he was telling me when I was there, uh, was attacked. And after um, that attack, the, a little boy from the village came up to him and he, and, and he had a spent bullet, a cartridge. And he said, you know, this is for the next time they come. You know, and obviously <laughs> you can't use, uh, you know, an old cartridge, right? But um, even little kids, um, wh whatever they can do, they are doing um, so that Ukraine can prevail. And it's, on the one hand, it's inspiring. On the other hand, it is absolutely, you know, heartbreaking. Um, the other thing I would say is that, so there is that resilience and there, there is that, um, that uh, ability to just keep on going um, despite all of the challenges that you see, you know, whether it is on the military side, whether it is on the economic side, the humanitarian side, uh, which, you know, the challenges are, are immense, but the Ukrainians are not going to give up because they know uh, that if they do, they will be killed. Um, they will either be killed by the Russians or they will be become Russians um, the way um, 
you know, we've seen with the kidnapped children and, and adults who are taken to Russia, who are given Russian names, you know, no longer addressed by their real names. They're given Russian names. They are no longer allowed to speak Ukrainian. They have to speak Russian. Um, they, you know, and for the little ones who are there for a long time, you know, they don't even know that they have families in Ukraine that love them and miss them and are trying to get them back. And so this is why the Ukrainians are fighting so hard and are going to keep on fighting. And, you know, every time I go there, you know, I see that, um, I see that, you know, that resilience and that, um, that, that desire to keep on going. Um, and it's, um, again, both heartbreaking on the one hand, but also very, very inspiring. Thank you. So heartbreaking in my mind. <laughs> it is very inspiring. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we have mics. If you would be so kind as to raise your hand so that someone with a mic can come up to you and then I can... Uh, how about the gentleman right here in the second row? And then maybe the gentleman over here. And then go to you. Uh, <clears throat> Is the microphone on? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, as a uh, USAID brat oh, all right. who is brought up uh, all over the place, uh, not so many nice places, uh, uh, I'd like to thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, it's, thank uh, you. It's, it's really something that I can commend to anybody who's got the guts uh, and the, and the uh, courage to do this. Uh, my question is, um, uh, Zelensky obviously wants to join NATO right away. Get a get a commitment to join NATO. What does he? What does Ukraine have to do that that besides win the war against Russia, mm -hmm. in order to qualify to to join NATO? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. I mean, um, we all know that the uh, NATO summit um, was uh, just held in Lithuania in Vilnius, and obviously. Um, uh, Zelensky came in, uh, you know, pretty, pretty uh, riled up and ready to do battle to get, you know, the absolute 150 percent of what what he needs from the U.S., from NATO, and from the West. Um, he didn't get everything he wanted, but I think he got a lot. Um, and I think it's important to remember that as we think about, you know, the long haul that this um, that this requires. That um, Ukraine um, got a commitment that. Uh, NATO is in the future of Ukraine, I think is the exact quote. And then you had multiple ad hoc statements, starting with um, President Biden, but with everybody else as well, saying that this will happen, Ukraine will join NATO. And so I, I, I'm not worried about that, but the specifics, as you point out, are, um, are kind of, you know, that's the gray area. We don't exactly know what, what that involves. It was left a little bit vague, um, but definitely that they are going to need uh, to make reforms on the democracy side, on the corruption side, although the word corruption was not uh, mentioned, and on um, you know the military side. Um, but I think that that is something we knew anyway. And, and I think in the communique it also said that there would be periodic reviews, which I think is good, um, because as we all know, reviews, <laughs> whatever your business, are action-forcing events, right? You, you quickly get your stuff together before that review takes place. But we all knew that Ukraine had to make those um, to take those steps. And if it wasn't for NATO that they needed to make those steps, they would have to do it for the EU. The EU has already put out what exactly the conditions are, and it's all about, you know, uh, democracy, corruption, and, um, and these are the steps. That, so it's things like um, reforming the court system, which we all know is critical, not only for rule of law for ordinary citizens, but also for commerce. You know, if, the Ukrainians want foreign investment in Ukraine, and it is, you know, as Natalie <laughs> told you, you know, it can be a challenge even today. And so the best thing they can do is reform their courts and is really establish a firm rule of law culture in Ukraine. Um, so that's already been laid out by the EU, and I think um, Ukraine is taking steps in the right direction. And even during the war, if you can imagine, even during the war, and they are continuing to make those steps. Um, and I think the same thing is going to be true for NATO, and I think there are going to be some no negotiations about what that exactly is. The other thing I just want to mention is that the G7 also met in Vilnius, and in some ways, at least to me, the, um, the statement and the actions that came out of the G7 were um, you know, as critical as uh, what came out of the NATO meeting, because 
um, basically the G7 all agreed um, that they would provide bilateral commitments um, to help Ukraine um, on the military side. Those will all be neg negotiated individually, and I heard Ambassador McCarva, the, the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. Um, on CNN earlier today talk about how, you know, she's ready, she's ready to start negotiating today. <laughs> um, and I think, um, I think we're going to see some real forward progress. But the signal that that sends to Ukraine is that we are in this for the long haul and we are going to make commitments um, and we are going to support them. And I think importantly, that is also the signal that it sends to Russia. Because this was a, you know, this was a summit that was all about signaling, but it was also about substance. And you can't argue with the substance. Um, that's going to be really important. So the next um, NATO summit is going to be in Washington, D.C. It's going to be the 75th uh, summit, so kind of historic. Um, and I think it's an opportunity uh, for the U.S. and for the other countries of NATO to really make strides and make good on that promise of Ukraine uh, has a future in NATO. Thank you. Yes, we wanted to ask when Where we have a... After, Could you raise your hand? Oh, please. Yes. Uh, we, we have a corrupt dictator, and Putin is not going to give up, and you know this far better. Now, we talk about the long haul. What will it take? Because in Russia, you had the slaughter of, of, of Russians. If that, uh, will there be enough Russians to rise up and say, we've had enough, we're going to change? And then the flip side is the terrible uh, loss of life that, that uh, the Ukrainians are, are experiencing. Yeah. And the long haul, the question is when and how? Well, um, I don't think anybody can actually really answer that question of how long it's going to take. Um, but I think that, um, you know, just looking at Russia, I agree with you that um, Putin is a dictator who knows no moral or any other kind of bounds and doesn't appear to have any, um, any limitations being put on him. And in fact, a friend of mine once said um, that, uh, you know, I never thought I'd say that I um, you know, miss the Politburo, but at least the Politburo puts some constraints on the, the first secretary of the Communist Party, and that is no longer the case. So recently, at the end of June, we saw the Prigozhin Rebellion, and um, yeah, I was talking to some people earlier uh, here tonight. I, I, I think that what we're seeing in terms of public commentary, and so I'm going to join that public commentary, is all speculation, because I don't think anybody really knows what is going on in Russia and what... Um, what um, uh, you know, what Putin is trying to do, and what Prigozhin um, is uh, is is doing either. We don't even actually know where he is physically located. Um, but I think um, I think that what we're seeing is, you know, we're not seeing the end of Putin there, but maybe we're seeing the beginning of the end um, because you know there was some weakness there, right? I mean, there wasn't um, the Russian military and other formations institutions did not push back on um, Prigozhin. Um, Prigozhin called his own people back, uh, his own men back. Um, and so I think, I'm sorry? Why was that? Well, because there was the, um, the compromise that allegedly Lukashenko, the, the dictator in Belarus, um, uh, negotiated uh, between Putin and um, Prigozhin. I mean, I think probably what happened, and again, I'm speculating, um, probably uh, Putin told Lukashenko what to say, because Lukashenko is not an independent actor from Russia. And um, so there was a, a compromise for, for the moment. Um, but then, you know, a couple of days ago, we got the very startling news, I mean, my head exploded, that Prigozhin and Putin met five days after this rebellion. I mean, this was after Putin called everybody who was in, in involved in this uh, rebellion a traitor to the country. So I think, you know, I think there's a lot going on and I think it's really hard for us to tell what is going on from the outside. I think it's hard for people within Russia, even well-connected Kremlin sources are having problems uh, figuring out what was, what's going on and, and how they position themselves in order to survive, right? Because I think that's where it is for Russia today. So I think we'll see. Um, and I think that any change in Russia is going to come from the top. And it won't necessarily be a good change either. Because of that civil society issue that we talked about, you can't expect it to arise yeah. from nowhere. And that's exactly where I was going to go. That um, I don't think the Russian people are going to rise up. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine that at this point, at any rate. 
over here, and then I'm going to ask whether there are any women that want to give questions before I give the men another <coughs> microphone. Okay, then we're going to go to this lady back here before... So go this ahead. be a question for you both. Uh, there's been a lot of comparisons between Churchill and Zelensky, and Zelensky's been very active globally, but what has Zelensky not done that Churchill did do? Hmm. And so if, if you had to go back to Churchill's playbook, what would you recommend Zelensky do? Because obviously, smoke it's cigars. Not, it's not I, a, I was going to say the brandy, and, and the Armenian drink, and, brandy. And, and, yeah, what, what was it that Churchill drank? Brandy? Oh, yeah. Whiskey? Armenian brandy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> did we interrupt you? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm afraid my, my history is probably not, um, not that good. I can tell you what Zelensky doesn't want to do that Churchill did, which is not be reelected post. War. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, I also don't have an answer, a good answer for the, the uh, what Churchill did. Yeah, but I, if I could just say one thing, I mean Churchill, you know, sometimes we forget this now. He was tenacious in his um, pursuit of FDR in the United States in terms of us providing assistance to um, to the Allies. It took us a long time. And, um, you know, I, I can really see the same thing with Zelensky, where he is never going to give up, and he's going to keep on encouraging us, shaming us, using all of those communication skills he learned as an actor, um, you know, for uh, not only for his own country, but I actually think, you know, for the future of the world. I mean, I think those, that's what the stakes are, just as it was back in World War II. So to the lady right here. Okay. Hi. Thank you. And then to the lady standing, okay, oh, after I'm that. Sorry. Um, it's okay. A question on um, the U.S. Um, uh, preventing, what's the word? To, to embargoes on Russia. Is that working um, at all? Are the people feeling it enough? And what do you think of that? Do you want to take that question? So I think you're, you're referring to sanctions, and I think... Um, I think what we need to think about sanctions is that they're one tool in a toolbox, um, in an economic <coughs> toolbox. And uh, not that I would necessarily agree, but when, when we started this process in February of 2024, or even going back to the original sanctions in 2014, to a large extent, they've been aimed at destroying or crippling, crippling um, Russia's military capabilities, not crippling the Russian economy, not hurting the Russian people. And so they've been very selective. And they've been very gradual. And so, you know, from a Ukrainian perspective, um, far too few. Uh, and given that only a certain number of countries actually abide by those sanctions, we were having a conversation earlier, there are countries that don't abide by the sanctions, uh, democratic countries, uh, who actually make money off of this um, uh, by re-trading um, products that are coming out of Russia they add some value to them, and then they re, they re-export them. You have um, an entire part of the world, the global south, that's not participating in the sanctions whatsoever. We have a way of dealing with that. That's called secondary sanctions, which means if you break the sanctions, um, country Z, um, then you cannot trade with the United States. But we are not using them. We are not employing them. And so there's a lot more that could be done. I think we've damaged their military supply, we've made it harder for them. They now have to go through machinations to get semiconductor chips. But the recent data, actually, that came out last week shows that they're getting an equivalent amount of semiconductor chips as they were before February 24th. Um, and they're using different routes to get them. So I think there's much, much more we could do. But um, this is the most we've ever done. And this is the most unity we've ever had in applying sanctions. Even countries like Switzerland have joined the sanctions. Countries like Singapore have, have added, um, <coughs> have taken on some of the sanctions. So it's better than nothing. But uh, from a Ukrainian perspective, it's kind of too little drawn out over too long a period of time and not, not, um, not enough to, again, certainly not enough to cripple the Russian economy. And we're not seeing the, the military technology crippled either yet. So they're still, they're still hanging on. We wish it was more. Yeah. Um, last, question. last question. Okay, just go ahead and give the mic to anyone you think is right. Is it on? <laughs> um, we, we have to take two because I promised this woman. So we're going to have to take two. So well, one and two quick two questions. At the same time? I'll take two questions right away. If you can give this woman, please, 
Okay, then we'll take oh. your question and yours, and then we'll have an ambassador answer. <laughs> what? Oh, no, she's going to Can't hear you. So um, we hear a lot in the press and the news about what we are doing militarily to help Ukraine, what the U.S. government is doing to help militarily. Um, but we also know, uh, sadly, from past experience that uh, the U.S. tends to be much better at winning the war than winning the peace. Do you know um, from your time in Ukraine, either of you in um, interactions there, what are we doing now to prepare to um, help Ukraine be better prepared for, to win the peace? Yeah. So it's not just us. I mean, I think there's a whole international, um, I say consortium, it's not that formal, um, that is thinking about this, as are the Ukrainians themselves. I mean, the Ukrainians have a plan as to how to build the Ukraine of the future, as opposed to you know rebuilding the past. Nobody wants that. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, there was a um, Ukrainian uh, reconstruction conference. Were you there? Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you should actually answer this question as well. I think the finance minister should answer this question. <laughs> So winning the peace, there's kind of two pieces that I would think we all need to think about. One is the rebuilding of the country that's been destroyed. And that starts with demining 200,000 square kilometers, a third of the country, the size of the country of Austria has been mined. And we all know how long it takes, we're still demining Cambodia. So we need to use new technologies, new approaches to quickly demine, because other the human losses are enormous, but there's also an agricultural issue in terms of food security for the world if we can't farm. So demining all the way through to the vision the Ukrainians have had, there's a coordination platform, the US, the EU, and Ukraine co-chair. The coordination is somewhat weak because I think most of our countries are so focused on winning the war, which Ukraine is as well, but there is a vision of a green Ukraine, of a Ukraine that is inclusive, a Ukraine that is a member of the European Union, meaning living up to EU standards in terms of judicial reform, in terms of everything from hygiene to, again, inclusivity, access, accessibility. Um, that plan includes uh, taking back the full country, <laughs> achieving justice and accountability on the non-building side. There are elements of the social contract that need to be restored. And there, again, I have to tell you, I'm very proud of Aspen Institute Kiev. We are currently running a series of um, seminars for Ukrainians on how we restore the social contract. How do we go from martial <laughs> law, which is a limiting element. It limits travel, speech, press, back to not the democracy we had, but an even better democracy. How do we deal with the mental health challenges of a country racked with PTSD, to be perfectly frank with you? Um, I, think, I think some of us even outside suffer from it. Um, I think the, the, the United States plays a leading role, but the European Union is going to play a leading role. And I think there's an expectation, since it will be tied to, this rebuilding will be tied to, accession to the European Union, that they have to play a leading role as well. It can't be the United States alone. And so I think it's a process. In, in my mind, you're looking at something, you know, multiple times larger than the Marshall Plan. So the official numbers are 400 billion as of February of this year. I think we're going to be at a trillion dollars easily before this is over. And that has to be financed not just by taxpayer monies, but it has to be financed by Russian uh, assets. There has to be the, the Russians have to pay for the disaster that they've created. <laughs> um, and I urge you to support uh, the frozen central bank Russian assets that should be turned over, as we did with when Iraq invaded Kuwait, to some appropriate trust to be then invested back into Ukraine. And the private sector has to play a role. And so we need security. We need kind of blended finance for people in the audience who are in that world. Um, we, need to, um, we need to bring everything together, but it will be a very high-tech, green uh, society that is very focused on uh, decentralized government because of our civil society. They won't let it go any other way, and I think you'll find that it's an, a Ukraine that's more exciting than any Ukraine you've seen to date, and the last 504 days have been pretty impressive, I think. Yeah, that's great. The, yeah. the woman back there, and then we're gonna finish. Uh, Ambassador, Sorry. thank you so much for underscoring the importance of the Foreign Service and the DOS in your book and how critical our Foreign Service is to uh, a healthy democracy. So what do you see going forward after the blows of the Trump administration, COVID, the undermining of our image in the world after our insurrection? Um, abroad? Yes. Well, I, I actually think that um, 
that we've made some um, steps forward uh, in terms of our standing in, in, in the world. And I think that um, President Biden, and I no longer work for the US government, so you know, this is my personal opinion, um, but I think President Biden has um, spent a lot of time trying to reach out to foreign leaders, um, both our friends and our foes, um, shoring up our friends and letting our foes know, you know exactly uh, where the US stands. Um, and I think um, he has spent a lot of time, and I think you could see that over the last couple of days in Vilnius, um, you know, uh, working with um, our allies to get to the solutions that needed to be done. I mean, the, whether Sweden was going to become the 31st member of NATO was a cliffhanger until the day before the summit. And part of that was um, US diplomacy, part of it was other things as well. Um, but I think there were some really serious negotiations. So I remember that, um, you know, very early on, and this is a story that President Biden himself um, shares, um, that very early on, in his administration, he went to the UK for the first uh, G7 meeting that he was participating in as president. And he, you know, bellied up to the table, I guess, and said, we're back. And one of the other leaders said, for how long? And so I think that, you know, building trust and building partnerships, building coalitions, takes a lot of time. And losing trust you know, that happens in a second. I mean, we see that in our personal relationships, but it's also true between countries. And so, you know, we have a, a, a lot of work still to do, but I think we are doing the work, uh, and I think it is bearing, um, bearing fruit. And I think um, that is also true with Ukraine, actually. Thank you, Ambassador. I know we didn't get to a lot of questions. There's an opportunity to buy the book and speak to the Ambassador but when you're, when you're purchasing the book. And I'll um, say thank you, and, and I'll give everyone the two words you need to know in Ukrainian. Slava Ukraini. Heroyam Slava. <laughs> That's the response, and it means glory to Ukraine. Yeah, thank you, that was great. So as you make your way out, please note that we're back here on Friday with Adam Gopnik and Vivian Schiller. We're going to make room for our speakers to get to the book signing. And thank you for joining us tonight on conversation on critical issues facing society.